Welcome, I am Cyril Stober. It's a digital world we live in with unimaginable advancements in science and technology, new technologies from social media and GPS systems to artificial intelligence and smart homes, all combined to present a new world that is moving at dizzying speeds. But with these awesome innovations and possibilities come threats and real threats to the drivable benefits of such advancements. The issues of the digital world are numerous, among them cyber security, which will engage our attention as I sit with my guest today, whose interests are in cyber security, user privacy, and digital forensics. Aisha Ali Gumbi is an associate professor of computer science and engineering at the Louisiana State University in the United States of America. She took a bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Abuja, MBA from Bayero University, Kanu, Masters in Computer Science, University of New Orleans in the USA, and a PhD in Engineering and Applied Sciences, also from the University of New Orleans in the USA. Now, the Louisiana State University, where she lectures, has been granted $1.5 million by the United States National Security Agency, NSA, to set up a pilot cybersecurity clinic to protect small businesses that are targets of cyber attacks. She has been selected as the director of the new cybersecurity clinic. Let's welcome Associate Professor Aisha Ali Gumbi. Thanks for coming on one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much for inviting me to your show. Right, it's, uh, we should say congratulations on that. You've been selected to be the director of this uh, cybersecurity clinic. It's uh, not a mean achievement by any standards. And uh, how does it make you feel going out there, a Nigerian? So um, I just recently moved to Louisiana State University and like um, every faculty, our job is to do research, um, bring in grants, and teach and, you know, engage in community service. And uh, for me, uh, in this second leg of my career, my goal has been to engage a lot in student focus, as well as the community around us. And so when uh, NSA uh, put out an RFP for um, a cybersecurity, they call it uh, Education Innovation uh, Initiative, and uh, I saw a focus in cybersecurity clinic model. So I thought this is something that I could build uh, the next leg of my career in. So I'm super excited uh, that our grant uh, was selected and we were awarded this $1.5 million. And we're gonna start the clinic in the fall, which I'll be directing. So it's, um, it's really an overwhelming joy i will tell you um that uh, we're going to make a difference in louisiana and i'm hoping that um this model for the clinic is going to be you know established everywhere within the global world hmm. you know some would say it's just like um yesterday uh, that you were at the university of abuja here in nigeria and no one at that time could have felt well uh, this is coming somewhere along the line and you just went on and moved to the United States and um, everyone around here has celebrated you including your alma mater the University of Abuja and saying well it does show that um, anyone can go out there and prove their metal especially a Nigerian to do that does that 
give you a sense of fulfillment, given oh, your background? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I could tell you, like, uh, when, when the story was published my, by my university, it is the story of any other grant, uh, because every university in the United States is excited to have a grant. But the reception in Nigeria was overwhelming. Um, I think at the beginning it was uh, really very overwhelming. But at some point, I think uh, from what I've read, from the emails I've received, from just thousands of comments that I've seen on different social media platforms, uh, pl uh, private and public, I think um, I became a story of a young Nigerian woman from sub-Saharan African, uh, Africa who, you know, believed in education and inspire others. So my story is, is just a story of somebody who really loves education and just went out there to you know, pursue that. And uh, in that, I never thought I could really inspire other people to you know, see me in that room. And uh, I think it's, it's, it brought a, a great sense of satisfaction to, to be that person that, you know, I think making a difference to other people's lives. All right, let's come to this digital age we live in and uh, we seem to be almost 100 percent reliant on gadgets computers uh, smartphones now we are into smart homes as well but as we said in our introduction these present some huge challenges Absolutely. our world that relies so much on data Yes. Anything can happen. Yes. And that brings us into the question of cybersecurity. Now, define for us what cybersecurity entails. So, uh, cybersecurity is pretty much just a discipline that uh, brings in different applications and processes that tries to prevent, protect, and detect any kind of cyber attack. And that could mean, you know, cyber attack on users, end users, uh, cyber attack on organization infrastructures or even nation state. Now, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we are in a digital age and uh, with everything being smart, um, we are even increasing the attack surface. So more than ever, this is a time where we're not only gonna be concentrating on developing means and techniques of protecting the infrastructure, but also sensitizing people on the importance of cybersecurity. And this is one of the goal of our clinic. Um, we we want to engage with small businesses, not to only tell them this is what you need to do, these are the best practices, these are you know, the new software that you should install, this is how you should do things, but we also want to do capacity building. We want to be able to train them. We want to be able to improve their cyber hygiene. We want them to understand what is cyber security and how that affects their businesses and how that you know, make or break their business. Um, so, you know, cybersecurity, cybersecurity is here to stay as long as technology stays. And we know technology is not slowing down anytime soon. Uh, so for us, um, you know, in cybersecurity, we are always thinking uh, of developing new capabilities uh, that deals with new attacks uh, that are brought in by, you know, new technologies and um, new devices. So that's kind of in brief what is cybersecurity. Okay, but with this going on, you begin to worry about the development of new capabilities, software, and the fact that some say, well, the more you develop, you know, you develop these uh, softwares, the more you attract the attention of hackers, um, you know, cyber criminals who are also looking out. And the damage that can be done, especially in the financial world, is huge. Just about everything relies on on, 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 on safe data. And so at some point, the worry is, would the world not be exposing itself unduly to something that might in the long run destroy it? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think this is uh, necessarily the case. Um, see, technology has brought in so many good things. Um, today, 
I can talk to my family all the way from the United States without having to come here. I can do video calls with my family. And so that's all thanks to technology. Uh, we've sent people to, you know, uh, the, the space and, you know, we, we've done so many things uh, thanks to technology. So I don't think technology is going to slow anytime soon. And um, not just software, even in, you know, hardware innovation, we have moved, you know, so many years ahead in terms of like developing new chips and new capabilities. So it's not going to stop anytime soon. And when we look at, um, you know, the, the advantage of what technology brought in, uh, we cannot just say because of cyber attack, we have to slow down. And now even with AI, we've seen, you know, how machine can be able to predict what we can do next and, and you know, what have you. So technology is not going to slow down. I think it's a good thing. Now, with cybersecurity, I think um, at the beginning, um, we as because I'm primarily a programmer, because I'm a, uh, I'm a computer scientist. And uh, so we programmers, you know, we're always thinking about how to move things forward, uh, how to develop the next thing. But security was not necessarily, um, you know, a focus in a lot of software design. But, I, but now, um, given all of the issues that we have in cybersecurity, we're doing a lot of security focused software development. Uh, we're trying to incorporate security by design from the beginning. And even in terms of like configuration, system configuration, we're trying to increase, you know, or improve cybersecurity as we design our systems in general, networking system protocols, uh, you know, databases, whatnot. So security is not a focus. So I think, uh, I don't think um, we'll say that, okay, technology is, you know, is improving and cyber attack. Obviously, it may or may not improve, it may not increase, but um, we will have better ways to tackle that. Right. And I think, yeah. Speaking about um, a rise in the rate of uh, uh, cyber crimes, and what are the current statistics saying? So um, I can give you that for small businesses, for instance. Um, almost like 50% of the entire uh, cyber attack today are on small businesses, okay? And 13% uh, of that, they're pretty much like ransomware, which means some, uh, an attacker could install a software on your system and then encrypt your device or your files and then ask you for a, for a ransom. And then you have to pay some certain amount of money, especially now that we have you know, Bitcoin technology, so you have to pay in cryptocurrency and then you get uh, a decryption key to decrypt your files. So it, it is something that is so, uh, so significant. And uh, a lot of times we have situations where people don't even report uh, cases of cyber attack because oftentimes there's a lot of reputational damage that comes with you know having media publicizing that there's a cyber attack and I can tell you that uh, in the United States for instance most of cyber attacks that we hear in the media uh, that that happens in bigger corporations mm -hmm. but those that happens like you know for uh, small businesses and even you know just end users you don't hear that a lot so there are so many varying statistics in you know the, the gravity but it is there and and I'm sure you know, for just an average person, we have received uncountable number of phishing emails, whether, you know, directly in our emails or sometimes even through social media. Like somebody may send you something on WhatsApp and then you click it and then you're... Uh, you you know. see, so that's, that's part of the issues we're looking at right. because, uh, I mean, something seems so harmless. And um, to me, for instance, I, I, just, I just click and the right. next thing, my details everything on sometimes even you know financial you right know. yes right so so this is where the sensitization needs to come into play we have to make sure that everybody uh, understand the risk of cyber attack it doesn't matter like what's your profession it doesn't matter uh you know where you work it doesn't matter what you do you know kids male female everybody needs to understand the risk of cyber attack we need to understand things that are red flag we need to understand you know if somebody sent something to us how do we verify that this is that person so there are technologies that helps us vet and you know identify that this looks fishy uh, and sometimes we have to use our common senses mm. to understand that this is not this doesn't smell good and then we should not really click on it in the financial systems for instance sometimes just a uh, you know an everyday user sees a mail or something coming and they imagine that it's coming from their banks it looks very much the same and um, for many who are not considered to be that, I mean, having any form of expertise in these matters, they just think, well, this is from my financial institution asking for these details and just innocently click. 
and that's it. Mm. Now, the, for the others, you just plug in something and then your whole device is corrupted. These days, there are warnings going around that um, people should minimize uh, their login onto public uh, uh, you know, internet facilities for fear of... Uh, in fact, there are some who say you plug in your phone in some places, you also risk your, I mean, your, your details being stolen. Right. Yeah, so, so all of this happens, actually, uh, and, and these are all different types of attacks. So, for instance, um, when, you know, you receive something, um, usually the attackers, they use kind of a mind game. Uh, that's kind of part of social engineering attack because, for instance, if they're, they're going to hack you, they want to pretend to be your bank. They could have a logo from GTB, for instance. Uh, they could use a domain name that looks like GTB, but maybe with small little changes that you may not likely even identify that that's not coming from GTB. And they may take uh, text from GTB Actual's email and just plug in somewhere. So you may think that's coming from a legitimate bank. So oftentimes we tell users that you have to vet very well. You have to look at the domain. You have to look at the content. You have to look at even the spelling. You have to look at capitalization. You have to look at so many things, even time of day. Does your bank often send you an email at that particular time of day? Does that look like your bank? Does your bank spell their name in cap locks? Does it, you know, do they spell it like in small letters? All of these things are important. And uh, when, when you talk about, for instance, you know, um, you plug in in your device uh, on, on a public Wi-Fi, for instance, um, a lot of times if you do not trust the Wi-Fi, we could check things like the, you know, the certificate, the type of protocol they're using. So all of this, if the user is not informed, they wouldn't really understand uh, what is the effect of that and how that at the end of the day is, is going to affect them and you know, whether they may be attacked or not. In other words, you must continue to remain one step ahead Absolutely. of uh, those who might be criminals or who might be trying to do uh, certain untoward things. But then you also have interests in forensics. Yes. Yes, and this we would like you to talk about. So, uh, so digital forensics pretty much is another offshoot of um, cybersecurity, if you will, because in most of universities in the United States and I think around the world, um, they're kind of seen as interlaced. So uh, most students that are kind of digital forensics students are sort of computer science students in cybersecurity focus, but then the offshoot into forensics. So with forensics, the idea is we're going to try to extract digital evidence or evidences from digital devices. And oftentimes, these evidences are evidences for cyber, a cyber attack or evidences left during cyber crime. So um, again, we all have devices. We may be the one using the device and these, you know, um, they, they may be a criminal investigation and, you know, the law enforcement are trying to extract some uh, evidence from the device. Now that's where digital forensics comes into play. So my uh, work in digital forensics pretty much is to try to come up with new tools and techniques that we can extract a lot of dif uh, different digital evidences from smartphones and IoT devices. That's kind of my focus. And um, I've, I've developed a um, uh, couple of tools, uh, mostly that uses memory forensics, so we can retrieve what we call data from the volatile memory, which is the transient memory that often kind of wipes out whenever you lose power. Um, but there are other part of digital forensics that could extract data from the uh, non-volatile storage. This is getting interesting to me because what I'm looking at here is, is anyone safe? If you could still, I mean, it's, it's been suggested that no matter what you do, we're all leaving prints yes, out there. Absolutely. Which can, even when you delete, yes. it is not completely eradicated or something like yes. that. Doesn't that worry you? Because um, again, such, such in the hands of uh, hostile administrations um, who are not entirely uh, democratic in certain uh, actions right. might just be, well, Big Brother is fine. Yeah, I can tell you as, uh, as, a, as a person that is in between cybersecurity and forensics, this is where I've done so many work, research work in cybersecurity core, which is the protection, right? Prevention of somebody trying to get your information. And at this side, um, I've, I've done some couple of work in digital forensic where I'm trying to extract remnant of information from your device. So I'm somewhere in between. I understand the privacy concern. I understand that, you know, um, 
the big brother might be, you know, kind of peeping into your device, which violate your privacy. And at the same time, I'm also trying to build tools where that protects your system. But I think when you look at it both ways, there are um, advantages. Um, a disadvantages, right? The, the privacy violation, which is one of them. But in terms of advantages in cybersecurity, we will always, from that perspective, we'll always want to see devices that we can, e uh, we can be able to prevent and protect. So we want to build in more um, functional security, more security that is robust, more security that we can rely on. So absolute security, which may not necessarily be the case, but we're trying to protect the device. But in forensics, Every law enforcement officer will want a device that they can get remnant of information because that's the only way we can get to the criminals. That's the only way we can know if somebody is trying to set up an attack. You know, and maybe um, it could be terrorist attack or it could be anything, right? This is how we can find somebody that is trying to harm other people. You know, maybe uh, in the case of a lot of issues on ch of child pornography, this is happening in a lot right. of countries. So this is how we can find evidence. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that, um, uh, the, the good sides of it. <laughs> if you will, the short while. But I just would like to expand this a little further and ask how, s as, a, you know, as, an, uh, as, a, uh, as an ordinary user, how circumspect should I be when I'm downloading stuff, um, apps that require, that ask to uh, grant access to things that are stored in my device. How circumspect should I be uh, right. for clicking on that? And, and sometimes when you deny such access, you can't go any further. Absolutely. So th that's another uh, offshoot of my work, which is in privacy. And I could tell you I'm a privacy advocate uh, because I think every user should uh, give an absolute um, uh, authority over their device so you have to authorize before somebody get access to anything but it's unfortunate uh, that a lot of application especially on smartphones I will say um, sort of violate our privacy and so if you look at it maybe uh, if you use Android I can mm -hmm. uh, give a case study with that uh, when Android started in 2000, uh, 2007 I think um, the kind of security model, we call it the permission model, it was kind of an all or none model. So you either allow all of the permissions and then install or just like not allow and just, you know, not install. And um, that was a very, very bad permission model. And I can tell you there have been so many research within the, from the beginning to like five years up to 2012, a lot of research on like Android has to fix that kind of permission system because you cannot force a user to you know approve everything when the user does not necessarily want to approve everything and you know the researchers also found that most of these applications do not necessarily need all of those permissions so we found them to be over permissioned and you know so with that i think there was a lot of pressure from the research community and android has to meet a little bit of change mm -hmm. and they now had this now one-time permission which is what we have right now so now we don't have to uh, allow all of the permissions you could allow permission as you go on but even with that Sometimes it's not, you will think, you know, it's not necessary that you have to have that permission. So for me, in my current research work that I'm doing, I'm, I'm trying to come up with a model that is called intent, um, intent aware permission model. So where a user is, uh, a user first has to consent. So not only tell the user that I want to use this very specific permission, but for what purpose? Because oftentimes the user is oblivious of why do you need my navigation data, right? The user doesn't really know. You just say, the apps just say, I want your location, but why? So that's what I wanted to answer. That's the kind of system that I'm trying to develop with my students where the user sees the request for the permission and the why for the permission and as an offshoot of that if the data stays on the device or the data is sent to another server and if it is sent to that server can you as the user tell the developer that i am done with this you know delete my data how do we then have a verifiable data deletion where you know i go to like nta right. app and say nta delete my data i don't want you to have my data anymore what is a mechanism that I can trust and you could trust and you know we could be able to uh, agree that you've deleted my data completely so we're kind of working on that and i'm so excited to see how that goes now let's look at um, the other side of it you've talked about using forensics to uh, you know gather evidence and 
in countries like Nigeria, where you have administrations moving ahead, taking advantage of uh, new systems to be able to forge ahead, for instance, in elections, uh, using digital technologies to enhance uh, the conduct of elections. Mm -hmm. And then we see highly advanced societies where there have been allegations of countries influencing the outcome of elections you know, using remote attacks. Right. But does, doesn't that give us the jitters of, I mean, if it could happen to those worlds, yes. <laughs> what might be the consequences for these parts? Yeah, ab absolutely. I think um, uh, so. This part of you know cyber is called like uh, misinformation or disinformation, or information integrity. And over the last, I think since 2016, it's been gaining ground. Uh, and I think uh, I can tell you this for for a fact that in the United States, it's one of the key areas of research. They're trying to come up with ways so we can identify misinformation and disinformation, and we should try to protect mi uh, ways in which this misinformation, disinformation influences social, you know, activities like like election uh, per se. So I think in, in Nigeria, we have to. We are a very big country, a country of over 200 million people, and uh, we're one country that have really accepted and adopted a lot of technology. And especially social media, we're very active, we have a very young population, and this kind of misinformation and disinformation can fly, I can tell you, very, very, very mm -hmm. fast. So how can we checkmate that? How can we make sure that only the right information flows? How can we track the flow of information? How can we uh, uh, collaborate with for instance, social media uh, uh, companies uh, to come up with techniques that's going to help the country move forward as a democratic country, you know, without being influenced by misinformation and disinformation. Let me even take this further and relate it to my profession here. As you speak of misinformation and disinformation, it brings to mind the question of fake news, mm -hmm. deep fakes, yes. and uh, technology has gone so far that you can take someone and make them say things that they never said in the, in, in the first place. Yes. And uh, these are moving at a, at, very <laughs> yeah. at, at a very high rate. And we're not doing that much in this part of the world right. to nip this in the bud. What should be the steps for us to take at this? Yeah, so, so this happens. In fact, you hear like your voice and you're not the person, <laughs> right? So, so th this is a very, very big problem. And I can tell you it's an evolving problem. Um, I think the only way forward is really investing in research, investing in education. We have young population, people that are, you know, I think technology very active. And if we can put them to good use, if we can invest in them in research, they will find solutions. People are working day in, day out on you know, developing new solutions that detect that this is a deep fake. They're detecting that this information is, you know, not the right information. This information is there to mislead. You know, as you just roll out any information, tools are out there that are trying to do those detection. But the problem is all of these tools are designed to understand, for instance, the news in those countries, uh, the language of those countries, the very peculiar situation in those countries. We have to come up with our own local solutions by our own local people that understand our own, you know, our uniqueness, our own situation, our own news, that follows our own news and, you know, understand the trend and then find, be able to detect that, you know, this is, for instance, you know, um, uh, 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 not correct, n not um, uh, a legitimate news, for instance, right? or it's not, uh, it's a deep fake, like, you know, it's not serial that is speaking. So we have to come up with our own local solutions for that. I think we cannot do that without investing in our youth and investing in research. All right. At this point, we'll take a short break. When we return, there'll be more as we talk about the digital world cybersecurity. Stay with us. We can file your Saturday delight going to places from the obscure to the hinterland and cities, bringing you development stories and perspectives, connecting the people with government and stakeholders on critical issues of our national life. We are live in Abuja. It's 9 p.m. every Saturday on the network service of the NTA. We can file. You can't afford to miss it. 
why should we be in a difficult situation financially? Once upon a time we were rich, but we are not a rich country anymore. Disaster management is everybody's business. In all these times, uh, the organization turned to Nigeria. We would as much want to harness the capacity that is within us uh, so that we see how we can uh, become self-reliant. One month ended and you said you are increasing one strike by two months. I mean, you are, you are incubating madness. Even if these are officials of government who have been told to go and enforce the law and they have gone against the law itself, they must be held accountable. One on one, Friday, 10.30 p.m. on NTA Network. Well, thanks for staying with us. I'm still here with my guest, and uh, we're talking about the digital world and cybersecurity. And just before the break, you mentioned something about investing more in education and research. And that's what I'd like us to talk about briefly, um, the place of education and research in all of this. It's not been... Uh, a very good scorecard for Nigeria, particularly in terms of research and even the education system. Yes, um, so um, I'm a product of a Nigerian education. I think since I had my, uh, I did my primary, primary school education, secondary school education, and university education here. So I had my first degree and even my MBA from Bayer University, Kano. So um, I can tell you we're doing something good. You know, there is, there is some baseline that we're doing that is good, but we need to do more. Um, and I think where we need to do more is in terms of, like, uh, research itself. We, we, we need to, of course, education, you know, teaching, we have to invest in that. Uh, you know, we have to go with the trend. We have to go with, you know, what's uh, evolving right now. But we have to invest in research. Uh, and I think that's something that we don't do at all. Uh, we're just talking about the National Security Agency investing $1.5 million into LSU to build a clinic with a focus on experiential learning for LSU students and engaging small businesses um, in improving their cyber posture and cyber hygiene. This is a big investment on just one university in order to improve you know, the, the, the activities of the community as well as improving education for their youths. Um, so where are we in Nigeria in terms of that? in terms of bringing you know, that kind of funding to universities mm -hmm. so that universities can be able to do that. We have a lot of intellectuals. We have really great minds here, and I think all we have to do is to encourage them and invest in them. I've, I've spoken to quite a number of academics, and um, I, I don't want to you know, go down the list of the challenges, the things that stand in their way when it comes to attracting grants or funding, and just about everything is government-dependent. And, and so, uh, research findings, there's a popular saying around here, as you well would know, uh, uh, somewhere sitting in files and gathering dust. Where is the disconnect between research finding the results and putting them and tailoring them to the needs of society? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I just had a, a workshop uh, in Gombe State University on grant writing uh, just uh, on, on last Tuesday. And uh, one of the things that uh, we, we talked about is um, research impact. So a lot of times with academics, we always, you know, think about publication because, of course, publication, you know, is what's going to get you tenure, it's what's going to get you promotion. But I think we have to also start to think beyond publication. Publication is great, you know, it's immortalized our work, which is absolutely fantastic. However, um, I think we have to also start to think what are those research objectives or research uh, ideas that are going to make a lasting impact in our society. And, uh, you know, I've challenged my colleagues here to always think about what are the problems that we have our local problems and what are the local solutions that we can come up with so we can solve our local problems. This is something that when I started my grad school in the United States, I see they so different. They're always looking for ideas, you know, from National Science Foundation to NSA to DOD, they're always looking for ideas that solve their local problems, that solve problems within their society and problems that have broader impact within their society. This is where we need to start channeling our energy. 
what are our local problems and how do we solve this problem so that we can have a broader impact within our society. So again, there is the challenge from you know where to get the funding. Of course, it could be you know uh, uh, from corporations, it could be from the government, it could be international, but also what is the research itself and what type of impact will that research translate into? So those are the things that we have to start thinking. About. Why do you think we're not consulting with our educational institutions, our research institutes in developing solutions to challenges that face the society here? We're mostly dependent on the World Bank, the IMF, building our financial uh, systems and things like that. What, what's, why, why do we not look inwards? So um, I think when, from my discussion at Gumbi State University, I think I had a lot of people now uh, looking into, into TED Fund to try to access research funds, so which is good. They're kind of trying to look uh, at, uh, at a local source of funding. Uh, I've also seen uh, some people talked about accessing research fund from CBN, so which is also another local source of funding. But I think international funds is great because we might get even bigger fund which can help solve, you know, as long as we're solving our local problems, I think that's a great thing. Um, so I'm, I've, I've not been here, you know, uh, a long time to kind of really understand the dynamics, but I think there are some local sources of funding, maybe that's not a lot, a lot, but there's also the international source of funding, which I think they both can tap into uh, and come up with some solutions. See, I'm, I'm looking here at the, at the situation where there's very little private sector interest right. in research and uh, so many other things we do. I'm, I'm, I'm hopping on this matter of research and right. education because uh, you just said it's uh, it's one of the keys to, to get ahead there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one other thing that I, I talked about and I kept emphasizing is the idea of trust. So um, I, I, I was telling the, the participants that nobody's going to give you money because of you. Nobody's going to give you money to make you rich. Like that's not what grant is all about. You're going to get research funding so you could do an actual research and make a difference. And I think um, sometimes there's always that issue. And somebody was mentioning things about you know working with some organization and you know finding out that a university was blacklisted and whatnot. So. Why would a university be blacklisted? It is blacklisted because of that mistrust. We have to find a way to understand that research funding is there as a selfless, or research itself it should be there as a selfless service. And if you want to engage in that, you're going to make sure that you're not there to become rich. You're, you're there to make a difference, to create an impactful work, to you know, uh, uh, develop solution to some real problems that is going to have a broader impact within the society. So trust is an important piece of research that a lot of times even you may have a great proposal. You may have, you know, your proposal has, you know, great merit, but then they look at the potential of success and they look at trust and they say that, no, we're not going to fund you because we don't think you're going to do the work. So I think one thing we have to emphasize is that trust. As you work with this uh a cybersecurity clinic and try to develop uh, uh, solutions to cyber attacks against small businesses, which are the engine group. What, what, what do you have in mind here that could be a fallout from your work that would be beneficial to? A country like Nigeria. Right. So, of course, uh, you know, um, uh, I can't remember the proverb, but they say something, everything starts from home, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm from Gombe, so obviously I've, uh, I've started working with Gombe State University in trying to improve their research. And that grant writing workshop was just one of them. Um, so we're kind of working on different modalities so we can improve their research posture in general. And that it's not very specific to computer science. Mm -hmm. And I told them I'm open to, like, you know, helping them in different capacity. Uh, so, so that's one aspect. But the second aspect, is this clinic for instance it's only designed for LSU students mm -hmm. uh, so that means it's going to directly benefit LSU right. students and um, also the businesses that are registered in Louisiana mm -hmm. however the, the the model for the clinic is supposed to mimic uh, medical clinics so you know like medical students they have to go through preclinicals and then come through clinicals and learn to do an actual hands-on experience right before they graduate so a um, couple of years ago, I think about 200 years ago or so, um, or 100 years ago, a law school started adopting that, that kind of clinic model in, you know, in their, law, pract in their uh, law education in the United States. So that means students, law students, they have to go through law clinic before they graduate so they can get that hands-on experience. So the idea is 
with cybersecurity clinic, we're piloting this project. And if it works, we want to adopt it in almost every school in the United States. So I think this is something that we could also borrow in Nigeria and adopt it so we can graduate students with highly skilled students that already have this experience even before they graduate. So I'm hoping that, you know, some universities here, they may want to tap into that and adopt the model, you know, even if it is not holistic, but, you know, part of the model so they can improve their education. Your first degree was in uh, computer science right here at home. Yes. So that puts you in a position to see what, the, what it is like in terms of uh, 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 computer education. How well would you say Nigeria is doing towards this? So um, I can tell you for a fact that um, there are areas that we were really good at, but there are areas that we, we need improvement. So for me as a computer scientist, like there are two major things that I need to be very good at. One is mathematics and the second one is programming. Uh, as an undergraduate student, for instance, um, we were very good at mathematics. And I could tell you, you know, I was, I was great in math and when I went like everything related to math, all my courses related to math, I was acing them even as a graduate student. But the programming component, we're not necessarily very good at that. So I think if, you know, in our education institution, this is somewhere, you know, for, for universities teaching computer science, this is an area where we need additional focus, we need to improve on. What do you think we need to focus more on as a country that is in a hurry to develop? Um, this, or would you, we de-emphasize the humanities? I've always had this argument. Mm. I, I don't necessarily think so. Um, you see, uh, for instance, I will tell you from the perspective of cybersecurity. Today, cybersecurity is really multidisciplinary, okay? So uh, in this my current clinic setting, I have, when I was bringing the team together, I had to look for people from the School of Business because I want to engage with small businesses. I don't know their language. I need mm. people that understand the language of School of Business. And even with cyber, I understand defensive and offensive cyber, but I don't understand risk management. And I think this is an important component of cyber. So what did I do? I engaged with School of Business. And then at some point we realized that, how huh, if our students are gonna go out and engage with small business, we need to indemnify them. So then naturally we're gonna to pivot to also looking for somebody from the law school. So my team encompasses so many people from different units. And so this is true for a lot of different projects in cyber. I've seen projects that uh, you know, uh, um, bring in together computer scientists and psychologists, computer science with political scientists. We're just talking about you know, fake news. I don't understand the content of the news. I can understand you know, how information flow in terms of technology, but I don't really understand like, you know, the content of news or understanding what exactly is fake and not fake. So if we have to come up with solution, I need somebody that understands journalism, right? So, so, and this is the story of so many different research. So I don't think we need to de-emphasize humanities. I think we have to understand how all of them can be brought together, especially in this very complex and dynamic world. Let me take you to what might be seen as the ultimate in all of this now, or in the digital world, the computer age and all that. And uh, I'm talking about AI at this point here. There have been fears expressed about the direction in which AI is going. And um, we've had reports of people who were associated with its development sounding a caveat, saying, this might, we might well, the world might well get to a stage where <laughs> robots would now do the thinking for the right. real world. Do you worry about such? I, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm a really very progressive person, if you <laughs> would. Um, I, I think I had somewhere, I cannot remember exactly where, but I, I heard that during the Industrial Revolution, a lot of people felt that, you know, with Industrial Revolution, people are going to go out of work and, and all of that. But I think, you know, as humans, we have that ability to, uh, to evolve, to morph with, you know, new things that happen to us, to adapt to new things that happen within our society. So I think, you know, AI is no different, or the age of AI is no different from the age of Industrial Revolution. So for, for us, well, what I will really kind of uh, advise or suggest is we have to understand the trend 
and make sure that we're ahead of the trend if you want to stay, you know, um, uh, uh, in job or you want to stay, you know, in, in practice, you have to understand what is the trend and go ahead of the trend. AI is not going to stop anywhere soon. It's always going to be there. In fact, we, we, it's going to evolve even more. But then this AI is developed by other people. Right, uh, you know, AI by itself cannot do anything. You have to have people program it. You have to have people, you know, developing the language for it. So then you could be able to go ahead of that and you know find a niche in it. So uh, I don't think it's going to take over uh, the world. It's going to not make people. It can only make people that want to be jobless jobless. But you can go ahead of the curve. Sometimes you give in to. Uh, the fantasy of imagining that there couldn't be anything beyond all of this. Is it possible to develop anything further where, you know, you, the c computers have uh, just about seemed to most people as the, uh, the, the end in itself? Do you s where do you see all of this going? Um, especially in the protection of critical data. I, I go back to that as we begin to wind down, because I worry that so many of the things the world depends on for smooth running uh, can easily be attacked. Yeah, so the, you know, go back to your first question, where is the end? I think as long as the human brain is functional, um, you know, there is just no end to what the human brain can think about. So there is no end to it. Like, you know, tomorrow is going to be something else. I can, you know, we all know maybe 20 years ago, there were no smartphones. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I remember while I was in University of Abuja, that was when GSM came, uh, you know, started. And I remember, like, you know, we had a friend that had 3310. No, yeah, the big yeah, Nokia well. phone. <laughs> and uh, that was just, you know, about 20 years ago, right? And then today, we have completely different types of phones. These are just not simple phones, but they're phones that can, you know, they're computers, literally, right? And we could literally do a anything with that you know device and so there is no end to that um, now protection of information I think we have to strive to do more we have to come up with technology as things in you know uh, as our technology evolve we have to evolve with the way we do things so for instance before when we talk about cybersecurity we only think about networked infrastructure organizational infrastructure we don't talk about end users we don't talk about smartphones but then smartphones came and we started to think about what are ways to protect end user data what are ways to protect now IOT devices you know smart home smart city so we kind of always thinking you know uh, with the technology but I think one thing that I will emphasize that we do better is to think ahead of the technology so that cybersecurity solutions come ahead of the technology not wait for the technology well as a computer scientist there are two things I'd ask you that first has to do with um, computers and uh, the amount of time that humans spend on computers and the other part of it We'll come to the aspect of information, where the smartphones have um, replaced virtually everything. And the thinking that these were things that were developed to enhance the world. In the case of um, telephony and the phones, to improve communication. Right. But you see some aspects of these now that have become a source of distraction. Yeah, absolutely. See, I mean, uh, you know, humans are always going to be humans. Um, you know, everything that has a positive side will always have some negative right, side, right? Right, now people are at home and there's no communication among family members. Yeah, everybody's people holding their on their, their phone or they're on their computers. Right. There's an accident on the road and uh, rather than call for help, yeah. where they have the phones to call, people are busy, right. you know, pick, taking pictures and posting and... Right. I mean, is all the bottom line of this is that is is the world losing its humanity to digital the digital revolution? I I can tell you. I mean, there, there is a truth to that, right? Um, we, we've seen all of these problems are manifesting in our society, and uh, I think uh, there are so many uh, psychological studies that find you know this is affecting our mental health and and, and what have you. But there's also the positive side where like before you don't engage with people thousands of miles away and now people make friendship people you know marry people you know you know create businesses and you know transactions and 
I mean, so many things are happening because of this technology. So how do we improve uh, on ourselves? Like, I'm not an expert in that because I'm not a psychologist, but I think uh, th there've been some solutions, uh, for instance, to that where uh, you have, you know, for instance, app that kind of reminds you, you know, about these things to, to like maybe, you know, keep your phone. You know, you've been using your phone these hours, you know, more this week and less this week. And I think for people that care about their mental health, this is important. Uh, for young generation uh, that may be minors, for instance, these are things that, uh, you know, their guardians, their parents can try to improve on, can try to say, okay, you know, you have a time limit on your device. You cannot use your device more than two hours, right? So, so that can help, you know, balance their mental health. On a final note, I'd like to return to you, the person, Aisha Ali Gumbi, researcher, um, lecturer, scientist. What are your cha what are, what are, what's the next stage of what you challenge yourself to do? Where do you see yourself next? Um, I I just want to make a difference. I I want to make a difference to uh, my society where I live and also my society here. Um, I think I'm an educator, so I care about education. I care about the young generation. And whatever I can do to make a difference in the lives of, lives of the young generation in terms of education, that's what I'll be focusing on. I was telling a colleague of mine that, uh, I think I probably mentioned that at the beginning, that you know, I, I just got tenured and promotion, and what's next? So I told him that I want to do something that, you know, change the way we do some, we, we educate young people. And then when the clinic happened, I just hop on it, and, you know, that gives me the opportunity to make a difference. And I'm hoping I'll continue to make a difference within, uh, in the lives of uh, the young generation uh, in my community in Louisiana as well as my community here in Nigeria. That's your driving force. Yes. Okay. We'd like to thank you very much for coming on One and One, and uh, we hope that uh, you'll come again some other time so uh, we can keep abreast of your latest work as okay. you pilot the affairs of the Cybersecurity Clinic. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. Thank you. And that's our program today. We thank you for watching. Next week, we'll be back with One and One. I'm Cyril Stober. Continue to stay safe. Thank you.